Hello, I'm Bob Burns, an elementary school educator in the San Diego area. Today I'm joined by some of the creators of the Show Me History series by Portable Press. This graphic nonfiction series currently has 17 books and counting and features a new historical hero and their story in each edition. Let me pass it off now to my fellow panelists to introduce themselves. Jim, let's start with you. Hi, thanks, Bob. Appreciate you being here today and uh, hope everyone enjoys our panel. Uh, I'm here. Uh, my name is James Buckley, Jr. I'm a non author of nonfiction books for kids. Uh, I've been doing this for about 20 years. I've written about 200 books, but as I like to tell my young readers, most of them are pretty short, so not quite as impressive as it sounds. Um, many of them are biographies, and so I was really excited by the opportunity to tell a, a true story, tell a biographical story in a new and this more exciting and colorful and picture-filled world of graphic nonfiction. And today we're going to talk a little bit about how those books uh, came to be and how we hope that they can be used by kids, uh, teachers, and classrooms all around the world. Thanks, Jim. Let's move on to our other author, Mark. Hi, I'm Mark Schulman. Uh, I'm an author of all kinds of books for kids, everything from sticker books to picture books to novels to graphic histories. And these have been really fun to do. I always like to try new books and new projects. And I'm going to say that the Show Me History books have excited me and used a lot of the skills of he had for all these other books, except fewer stickers. Thanks, Mark. And our letterer takes care of the lettering on, the, on throughout the book is John. John? I am John Rochelle. I do the lettering and graphic design for all the Show Me History books, uh, along with my team uh, at Comic Craft and Swell Type. Uh, and we have a group of uh, youngsters who uh, help me put all the word balloons and sound effects, and we do all the logos, titles, um, newspapers. We did some boxing posters. We had a lot of fun with these books doing all kinds of graphic design. Thanks, John. And who brings these characters to life, our graphic artist, Cassie. Hi, uh, I'm Cassie Anderson, and I um, illustrated or helped illustrate about four or five of these Show Me History books. Um, I've done all the colors, inks, and pencils on Frida, um, and then I got to help along the process with Harriet Tubman, Sacagawea, and Gandhi. Um, yeah, it's been a lot of fun to get to learn about more about these historical figures and also get to help portray them in these graphic novel portrayals of them. Thanks, all. We're going to jump right into some questions to learn more about the series and um, your experiences. And I think, you know, after meeting you, um, I'd like to know, like, you all have to collaborate together, um, putting these books and stories together. Can, uh, can we explain how that goes, how that process works? We'll go ahead and start with Mark. Well, what happens is we decide on which characters uh, in history that we want to uh, discuss. And we wanted a broad range of characters, people who began uh, in, from the beginning of the American Revolution uh, all the way to Muhammad Ali and close to modern time. Um, we wanted people who represented a broad brush strokes of the world. And so we tried to put together uh, 19 completely original ways to tell the stories, 19 people. And so when we sat down to figure out how we wanted to do this, uh, Jim Buckley and I, who have been directing the project, uh, have been really focusing on telling stories that while people are famous, they don't always have their stories told, all the parts of them, the interesting parts, little interesting places where we could go in and, and show people how much more there was to these characters so that they come to life because essentially for a lot of children, history is something that feels dried and compressed. And we knew that we could make more come out of it. A lot of the, a lot of the early stages of the process is, uh, uh, for Mark and I is the research process of discovering all that we possibly can about a particular person. And one of the skills of us as nonfiction authors is, is condensing and uh, uh, contracting and finding the key things. Uh, a person's life, I did, I wrote the book on Gandhi, he lived to be 83. There's an awful lot that happened in that life. So as an author, what are the choices we make of which incidents in their life to cover, which themes of uh, growth and change that they went through in their lives? 
making a lot of choices is one of the first things we do in collaboration. And, and once Mark and I have uh, put together uh, a sort of an outline of where we want to go with it, um, the first step in a comic graphic novel is to write the script. It's kind of like being a, a screenplay author. We have to think very visually and uh, we have no skill with art whatsoever. Mark, I've seen Mark's drawing. It's really not a pretty thing. Mm -hmm. And so we, we know that we need an expert to turn um, some of our ideas uh, into art. And, and that's where we collaborate with fantastic artists like Cassie. Uh, for us as authors, we start with the words. But that's all we have is words. And we know that this uh, process involves very important pictures as well. And so what we give to the artist is a script that says, here's what we think happens on each page. Here are the words the characters say. But at that point, this is where the real creativity of the artist comes in, is to take what was sort of in our head as words and turn it into pictures. And just as we did research on, on a particular person's life and the dates and the, the events and the names, Cassie had to do research uh, and she can talk to us a little bit about the research of, of discovering what a person looked like. You know, how do you, how did they dress? What colors did they wear? What did their face look like? How did they move? Um, so Cassie, maybe you can talk a little about to turning all the typing that Mark and I did into, into beauty. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really fun and challenging to get a script, you know, that's just a bunch of words and then turn it into lines and colors. That's something you can, you know, easily look at and recognize. Um, there's a lot that goes into designing just one page or even one panel on a page um, and getting that script to really shine. Uh, and, and I think as I'm thinking through how I'm designing a comic page, I'm also thinking about like how the letters come into play later. Like where, where are the speech balloons going to go? Like, is it going to crowd the characters too much? Is it, uh, how much room do we actually have for the characters in this panel? Um, and thinking all through those things. Yeah, and for reference and research stuff, uh, that's always one of my favorite parts of the process. I can get a little bit bogged down. I'm not bogged down, but I, I go down a rabbit hole sometimes. Where <laughs> I just start clicking on images. And I'm like, oh, that's fascinating. And I read an article and I come out learning so much about the character that we're telling the story about. Um, yeah, and it's, uh, I've learned, uh, working on the Show Me History books has been my first time working in nonfiction comics. Uh, and it's been a lot of responsibility to to tell this story of a real person and to represent them well on the page. Because um, I'm not just, you know, designing a character to make them look however I want. Like, I really want to make their character and personality shine and, um, yeah, and be able to do that really well is challenging. But it's fun. I like it a lot. Fun. Glad to hear it. We really Thanks, do. It, you mentioned You mentioned the lettering and things like that. Uh, John, can you talk to us about your part in this process? Uh, well, first of all, I just want to say thanks, Cassie, for leaving room for the word balloons. We, we, <laughs> we really appreciate that. Um, yeah, as a letterer, sometimes it's just our job to just find where we could possibly fit the text in. Um, but when an artist is, is thinking about that as they're drawing, it, it definitely leaves us a, a lot of room to kind of tell the story in the best way possible. Um, and, and the balloons kind of do a lot of jobs, which is, you know, you're leading the reader around the page. You're, you're kind of giving them clues what to read, um, when, and you're, you're kind of setting the pace of the story as well. Um, but I, I got to have a lot of fun doing research on things like, like boxing posters for Muhammad Ali or, you know, going back to the Revolutionary War era and trying to find, you know, examples of type and handwriting and, and sort of trying to make each book period appropriate in terms of, of the text and in terms of how we presented the story with like the captions and the, um, the kind of graphics around the story and then actually graphics in the story. Like if there was a poster or, um, you know, a letter that was written um, or even, you know, how did text messages look in Alexander Hamilton's time? <laughs> When Mark would do, or Jim would do crazy kind of hybrid things where they would have some kind of a future context or like a current thing, like a text message, but how it would have looked um, in Revolutionary War times, it kind of created some strange hybrids, but it was always like fun challenges at the same time to, to see how we could make that work. 
And I think the important thing about hearing all of this is that it didn't just step, it wasn't just step by step by step. It was very circular. In other words, mm -hmm. after Cassie finished something, she might have a better idea than what I had to present some information and we would be very excited, great. Or John would say, what if we lettered this this way? It might mean changing some of the script or moving some of the art. Everything that we did together to make the story go forward and present something to the reader was worth approaching. So it's a very group collaborative teamwork effort. Everybody has their particular job, um, but just like on a sports team, you've got to have everybody pushing in the same direction. And that was the best part about this was that um, Cassie and all the artists and John and Mark and I all were pushing in the same direction. And it was a really positive collaborative uh, process. And I think for, for teachers looking to do something like this in the classroom is don't let the kids just be the artist or don't let the kids just be the writer. Make sure that they understand that they're part of a team. Everybody's on the same team getting the story told. And, and we think the stories ended up being, you know, we, we hope pretty interesting. We wanted fun stories that were mm -hmm. real. And those aren't really uh, hard to find because history tends to be something that gets turned into uh, uh, an, an obligatory kind of message for kids that you have to know these points. But in between the points, they were people. And mm -hmm. those people had very quirky things in their lives. You know, I, I learned odd, the oddest parts of Ben Franklin's life that I, we didn't know. Or, or even Susan B. Anthony kind of kicked down and had fun sometimes. Sure. So mm -hmm. when we did go through all these, all these parts, the art would show up and then we'd look at it and go, oh, that's great, hold on. And I'd have to start rewriting again to fit what I saw in the art to better amplify how real these people's lives were and how much fun they had. Susan B. Anthony, she spent all her time without a house. So <laughs> she, all she had was a trunk. So we just had her walking through the storyline from end to end, year after year, dragging a giant steamer trunk behind her, which in fact turned out to be the real one I photographed up in her attic uh, on a tour. So Talk when you can get that research, stuff yeah. <laughs> and put it in, then you're giving more to the project. Right. And, and the visual nature of the graphic novel format allows us to do that. When a kid reads a story about Susan B. Anthony or Albert Einstein and all they see is the words or maybe a couple of line drawings, black and white line drawings, that's not enough. And, and the, the way that Cassie and the artists were able to turn these essentially to, to a kid, somebody who lived 300 years ago as a fictional character, they don't know what that person looks like. They didn't see that person move. There's no video. There's no TikTok video of a, uh, Alexander Hamilton reading the Declaration of Independence, although that would be cool, by the way. Remember <laughs> that for next time. We got to add some TikTok to the next series. But um, uh, so, so what Cassie was able to do is to make people come alive. And that's what, what teachers and students really just look for in history is to make it come alive and make it relevant and connect it to their lives. And the humor that we were able to add in, uh, as Mark said, was a key part of that. And that's what's really fun about the Show Me History books is they aren't classic comics, as some of the teachers might remember. These are uh, really engaging, uh, interactive two-way stories between the reader and, uh, and the artists, in, in, or, or typists in my case. And uh, that's what's really fun about these. It's a group effort to tell a great, positive, fun, and real story. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Okay, so um, you guys touched on quite a few topics as, as, as you were talking right now, but um, when John mentioned going back and, and, and finding like Muhammad Ali posters or back in history, um, in today's times, as a, as a teacher, critical thinking is such an important part of, of what we're hopefully trying to get our kids to, to learn. So what, what are some of the places, when you do your research, where are you getting your information as, as, as you research these graphic novels? And we'll go ahead and start with Jim. Well, the, the thing I tell the kids when I present to classrooms about research is that to remember that you're always going to do a lot more research than ends up on the page. One of the nice things about doing biographies, especially of relatively famous people, as we've done throughout this, is that many really, really talented people have gone before us and created very lengthy, very detailed, long biographical stories of these people. So. The first thing that I did in, in my case was basically to find the longest and best biography of and most recognized authority on a particular person and read that from cover to cover, taking copious notes along the way. Uh, I would usually read two or three other biographies of this person if possible. 
especially ones written for younger readers, so I could see what kind of things that other authors were telling younger readers. Um, what's nice about the couple of the ones I was able to do, Babe Ruth and Muhammad Ali, obviously I'm a sports fan, so that helps a lot, but uh, I was able to use a lot of contemporary research, and I think this is one thing kids kind of forget is that, um, at least in the 20th century, we now have access to contemporary research, basically firsthand of what happened then. So I could read the New York Times article on Babe Ruth's uh, 500th home run. I could read, uh, see a, a video of Muhammad Ali being interviewed by Howard Cosell. So it's not just books, uh, it's not just the internet. Um, obviously, teachers are really good now, I hope, about un helping kids understand the difference between some of the internet places they find. And we certainly did tons of research on the internet, but a lot of that has to be through a prism of where were they coming from. Uh, for the Gandhi book, there is a lot of controversy about his life, and so there were a lot of people who had written about him that I clearly saw had a, an agenda uh, that was different than the facts. And uh, so you, you have to sort of, through basically through practice, and as you say, critical thinking, look at different sources. Um, and so it really becomes a question of understanding the source uh, and distilling a huge amount of information down. But you're, Kids, you can't get away with just reading one book. You, you just got to keep reading. The more research you end up with, the more research, more research you start with, the better book you end up with at the end. And, and I know Mark had a lot of fun with some of his uh, colonial research. He got to walk downtown where he lives. Uh, the, what Jim says about the depth of the research is true. The other side of that is, is a kind of a width of, de of research. Because if you get from different sources, you're going to see that there are points where everybody agrees. And those are points that you should make sure you have. And so the famous parts of a person's life need to be addressed because you can't miss them. And if it's somebody like Walt Disney, I discovered I have a lot of points to call it. I've got a, I've got a name check about 300 things he did just because you'll wonder where they were if they're not there. So how to do that is a, is a big part of the process and to still be interesting and not just recite a list, um, but they have to be there. And um, how to kind of think about what's more important to make sure that George Washington's life is, is itemized from end to end or that we really give you a, um, something rich inside of his life. So that means that you put each of your research uh, places that you've come from uh, big books for adults, but a lot of books that or and, and things written for kids, because if you look at them like a Venn diagram, they're all going to, there'll be things in the center that have to be there. Look in there, make sure you have those. Then find something you never saw before that interests you as a writer, as a researcher. Oh, as soon as you get that feeling, that little ping goes off, and you got, you got to make sure it's in there. And I'm sure that Cassie and John in their research came to the same conclusions. Oh, I want that. <laughs> All I saw was, John, there's going to be 50 scrolls on this page. Uh, see how you can fit them in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I Cassie, I, I, yeah, uh, Cassie, must, you must have had to go to find the, the, just the costumes of people alone. How, how did mm -hmm. you find out like what color saris were for Gandhi or uh, you know, how, Sa how Sacagawea got through the, her day, you know, fashion wise. Yeah, with the more modern people, it's a lot easier to do research because obviously for Gandhi and Frida Kahlo, there's so much visual reference out there. Um, I mean, with Frida, we have her, her own paintings of herself. We have photos of her, we have even video clips. Um, and with Gandhi, there's a lot of photos out there too for him. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's really fun though getting to like, oh, okay, I want to steal that outfit or that hairstyle, or I'm going to take these things and kind of combine them and make my own version that still, you know, represents them well. Um, but when it came to like Sacagawea, it's a lot harder because we don't have you know actual photos of her. We have a lot of other artist representation of how she would appear and what her clothing might look like. Um, but having to do a different kind of research of like, okay, well, you know, what did her people, you know, what did they, where did they live? Like what kind of climate was it? And, uh, and she's got her baby on her back the whole time. So it's like, what does that baby carrier look like? And how is it attached to her? And, <laughs> uh, sure. So I kind of had to, I got to make up a little bit more when it came to her and, and even to Lewis and Clark um, and their outfits. But it was fun to, to piece together what I knew for sure from, from history and also like kind of incorporating my own imagination into it. 
Very cool out there. And Bob, I should mention that for Bob, I should mention that for Sacagawea and for a couple of the other books, we did also rely on outside consultants who are experts in their area. We had the Sacagawea book reviewed by a Native American uh, expert in Native American history to make sure that we were making sure we were w within the realm of comics, obviously uh, being as accurate as possible. Um, I had some other people who are uh, much more versed in. Uh, Black History Read, the Muhammad Ali book that I read, wrote, because even though I've written three other books on Muhammad Ali, there's always another perspective that I might not understand. So I think that's a, it was an important part of our, our all of our books is to make sure that they uh, were really representative of, of everybody's point of view, but still factual and true. Very nice. Um, Cassie, I wanted to ask you, it, um, were there, were you, growing up, were there comic books that inspired you as, as you look at your artwork and stuff? Um, you know, it, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, growing up, I've, I've always been drawing and I've always been telling stories. Uh, I would make my own comics a lot growing up, but there weren't a lot that I read. I read some manga, like Japanese comic books, um, but there weren't a lot of like American storytelling that I would read. Not until I got to college, I was pursuing storyboarding. I was going to go into animation, but uh, I ended up falling in love with comics. Uh, I think I read Vera Brosko's book, Anya's Ghost, um, and it kind of shifted my perspective. I was like, oh, comics don't have to be superheroes. Like there's this whole other type of storytelling you can do with comics. And it got me really excited about like, okay, what kind of comics do I want to make? Like what kind of stories do I want to tell? Um, yeah. Very good. How about you, John? You have uh, anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, I just grew up reading Spider-Man comics and that was, <laughs> <laughs> and since there were like five of them a month, that was all I could afford. So that's the only comics I read. Um, but I think, especially as I got working in the industry, I realized what Cassie realized, which is that the medium isn't necessarily one genre. It, it can be any, it can tell any kind of story. Um, and the, and I think one of the really cool things about comics as a medium is that your budget you know, for drawing a person standing on the street or flying through space is the same. It's not like a movie where you've got to have huge sets or, you know, special effects. It's like you're drawing something, you can draw anything and the, and the budget is the same. So, um, and I think these books, we had a lot of fun, especially as, as Mark and Jim started seeing their writing come back as pictures, they were realizing like, oh, we can do a lot of cool stuff with this medium to tell the story in a way that's not necessarily literal, but you know, makes sense in the context of the book. Like I think about the Albert Einstein sequences where he sort of goes into this sort of inner space realm, you know, with grids and uh, planets and stuff. And he's explaining how relativity works. And it's, you know, it's not something you could ever, it would be really difficult to film, right? But you can draw a train going through, you know, imaginary space and falling out of elevators and all this sort of illogical stuff that would have been, you know, very difficult to do in another medium is is just really natural for comics, and I think was a really effective way of of communicating those concepts. In fact, I was I remember reading it when when we'd finished and going, "Oh, now I understand <laughs> this scientific <laughs> concept that I maybe you know that in a way that I never had before." Right. So I think, I think it was a really effective use of the of the medium of comics in a way to tell these stories. Well, that's the best part about these is that I think we really have finally gotten over the stigma of comics as not a thing for kids to read. And, and that was one of the things when we were growing up and we were reading comics that was seen as a second string or a third string kind of literature or writing or reading. And today I think that has gone away. I think the skill of some of the many artists and writers who are out there creating comics for kids, whether it's graphic novels made up or graphic nonfiction, as in our case, um, the medium has become uh, vastly more accepted, especially in classrooms, and that's so much fun for us is to be able to, to, to know that teachers are using these books to do the same great work they've always done, but now we've given them a different tool and a different way to approach it. So a kid who maybe isn't a super strong reader can find the same information and get the same joy of history that, that uh, they get from a 250-page you know, nonfiction book with three pictures in the middle they can get the same cool uh, reading of history from a 100 page graphic nonfiction book. And so the, to see the acceptance of this medium for us as creators is, is fantastic. I, I really think it opens up so many worlds for kids to, to learn from. And I know Mark goes into classrooms a lot and he's done a great presentation about 
about how to use this kind of material. And so, uh, you know, talk a, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the things you've heard from teachers and kids about how these books work with them or for them. Did, did you call our childhood comic books literature? <laughs> well, I, I'm stretching I a point here, so. <laughs> yeah, no, I, mean, I, then I was trying to keep my folks from throwing away my literature on a regular basis. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. I should have um, called it literature back then. It would have saved yeah, a few more, comics, yeah. Well, for short, litter. But they did tell us um, uh, when, we, when comics were first coming out that um, they were going to destroy the minds of children. And there was a, yeah. even the U.S. Congress in the 50s went out of its way to stop that from happening. And as you see, they failed. The best part about our books is that I don't think, I think we're better than the history books that are just written out because you're not compelled from page to page in text to keep going. But the thing about a, a graphic format is you just keep flipping through it. You, you're not gonna stop because you got bored by one fact. A fact will sometimes stop you like a, a wall but when we have our books, you just know that it's gonna keep refreshing as you're reading it, that you're gonna keep getting more storytelling. And I think that's because sometimes history as text feels like homework, but history as a graphic comic feels like you're reading a comic. You bring that to it, and so you just keep going on and on. Uh, that's what I've learned with uh, um, the schools, the teachers that I have talked to has been that kids will take almost any kind of information served to them in a comic book format, so long as it doesn't talk down to them and it has uh, an aspect of quality to it. And that what we're all doing is wanting to give them messages they will like. It is, we're producing something they want. And that is the joy of this. It's not obligation. They call this secondary material. It really is sometimes the only way in that a kid is going to have to a lot of these topics. Uh, and what makes me uh, thrilled about this series is that what John was saying, that he was able to pick up on the theory of relativity from what we did, from, from, from uh, taking ideas that I had to drag from all these sources and finally compress into a place where they could make sense to me and then get it out. I don't think you can do that in another format. I watched mm -hmm. YouTube videos one after the other about relativity and it never, I couldn't get my head around it. <laughs> Finally, it worked. It took a month of playing around and pretending yeah. that that was what I do for a living was watching relativity videos. But when it happened, it made sense. Mm -hmm. And that was what I wanted to bring into the books was okay, I've done the hard work of turning it into a comic that still gets the point across. If, if, since that's what a teacher does every single day, it just builds up my respect for what they go through. I, I couldn't do it. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think uh, to Mark's point about the relativity uh, uh, and, and explaining difficult concepts, the other thing it's important to know about this series, especially from a teacher's point of view, is that we didn't shy away from the harder topics, even though they're drawn with colorful comics and splash pages and, and John's really cool lettering. It doesn't, that doesn't take away from the fact that, that we talk about Harriet Tubman's life as a slave, that we talked about Helen Keller's difficulties uh, being unable to communicate with anybody around her, that we talked about Gandhi uh, going to jail, although we did change it into a jail day counter. So he had a flip count. <laughs> for all the days he spent in jail. So it balances everything. But we did not be afraid, and Mark, especially in the Anne Frank book, um, had to take on some really tough things. And so that became a challenge for the artist, for the letterer, and for the authors uh, to make sure that we didn't lose track of the fact that these were real things, these were important things, but at the same time, we can present them in a, in a colorful and, and interactive and interesting way. Um, I fortunately, you know, I, we all, all of it, each or one of us and, and our artists as well had to take on some tough things. But um, I think the, the fun part about the collaborative process that we did was that we all worked together to make sure that they weren't overwhelming for the reader uh, or for the creators. Here, here, we actually have some screenshots of the of controversial types of, of subjects that we went into. Um, like, for instance, with uh, in the Ben Franklin book, I have him and Thomas Jefferson talking about the writing of the Declaration of Independence. Franklin actually spent a lot more time on it than people may know. And when he is 
talking with Jefferson, uh, Franklin is the one who changes the, do we have the screen grab for that? Uh, Franklin is the one who's, who suggests that we hold these truths to be self-evident. He rewrites it. So Jefferson's slave leans in and says, do you really mean that? And you see what Jefferson's response is. Go get us some wine. So that doesn't really bode well for Jefferson, and it does look straightforwardly at it. Uh, in another one, uh, Albert Einstein's book, Einstein's theory of relativity led to the atomic bomb and how he felt about it. The fact that he created the, the, the possibility of the destruction of two cities weighed heavily on him. He'd been to Hiroshima in his life. I found that out in the 1920s. Um, and, 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 and his guilt reigns into the last part of the book. Uh, and in the Walt Disney book, you know, people like to think of the magic kingdom, but in fact, he didn't have good working conditions. His artists were, were there. We, we had him originally had them chained and uh, we had to take the chains off. We thought that might be a little much, but, uh, and, and in the next picture, all of the um, artists end up going on strike. Uh, and you get to see, if we go to the next picture, that there are, um, these are actual protest uh, signs that uh, the artists had walking around, the cartoonists. So Cassie, you, you, you know, you're in good company. Um, but to show this and to tell this about uh, a character uh, in history is actually important for us to make sure we put in as well as the happy parts. Again, I, I noticed on the screenshots there that uh, we have different colored voice bubbles. We saw, I saw brown that looked like the actual words. Cassie, would, would, who, would, who would be able to address what, what, what's the difference? Why are there different colors in the, in the, in the actual text? That's for John. Our letterer. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that, that was one of the first things we worked on actually when, when we were sort of working up the first proposal was how do we display, or Jim and Mark were asking me, how do we display text that's clearly, that's, you know, literally taken from history versus what their interpretation was. Um, and we just came up with the yellow balloons. Um, I just thought of ye the yellowish balloons kind of looked older kind of like the paper had yellowed so they were <laughs> they were being pulled from history and we ended up just using that that color we kind of reserved that color at least on the lettering objects through the whole books if you ever see those those pale yellow balloons you know that that's it's an actual quote and we ended up having you know pale yellow um writings like if they were doing if they were writing you would see their handwriting on a page and we would always color that color so that was just kind of like so sometimes a subtle visual cue and sometimes an obvious visual cue um, that hopefully, you know, it's one of those things um, with comics too, is like you set up the, you set up the sort of style at the beginning and then hopefully those things become kind of invisible as the, and or, or more subconscious as the, as the reader goes along, they're just absorbing it, but they're not having to think about it, you know, literally. Um, and, and hopefully that worked. Yeah. For yeah. instance, in Gandhi, Mrs. Gandhi always wears green. Well, Mrs. Gandhi did not wear green every day of her life. It was not a superhero uniform. But when Cassie was drawing her <laughs> to make sure that we knew that everybody knew it was Mrs. Gandhi throughout, it was easier to have her wear a consistent color. And, and that's something that the teachers can show kids is that um, the reason that they're wearing or dressed as something uh, that makes about that makes that that's why we do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, go ahead, Mark, you have something you'd like to share? Oh, no, just, just to say that when, when uh, for each of the characters, you know, there are some, some conventions that we need to, uh, to make sure we have and to make it easy for kids to remember through a story who's who. And that's, uh, uh, so, so there are things we do that are, are tricks of just always wearing the same color or always having somebody uh, have some aspect of their personality shown so it doesn't get confusing. Then they can keep the characters straight. Earlier, we talked about collaboration, and, and as, as I hear you guys talk, I was just wondering, like, you, how does that process work, actually? So, Jim, you and Mark, you write the story. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and, I mean, is there ever back and forth? Does Cassie ever draw pictures, and then you see her pictures and, and kind of read, change, not change the text, but the formatting of the book itself? Not the format. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, uh, definitely. There, there's definitely a lot of give and take. I, we, we told all the artists um, and John that at any point, if you had a better idea than us, that we wanted to hear it. And they often did, because Mark and I are just, we're just typists. We don't necessarily always think visually. Um, 
Uh, there, there's one example I think I sent in that, that we can show you of, of a collaboration between Cassie and I on the Frida Kahlo book, um, if, if our invisible assistant has that handy. Um, at one point, Frida had been very badly injured and she needed to get better. And I wanted to show her doing all the different things that she um, uh, took part in. And so I basically, the script for this page was, uh, her dad talking to her and saying, you can do anything else the boys can do. Uh, you can do anything else everyone can do, except even boys. And then I just wrote, Frida does some active things like, you know, baseball, football, soccer, swimming. And so then Cassie, and this is actually a spread. If you go to the next page, you can see how they work together. Cassie put the personality in. Cassie made Frida, young Frida come to life. She gave her that intense expression. She gave her that intense emotion. I didn't even think of that. Okay, that's the kind of stuff that she brought to the table. And she said, I'm gonna make this the most determined young girl who's gonna just box and play baseball and wrestle with the boys and swim and overcome this terrible injury that she had. And that's the kind of uh, collaboration that I was able to do. I really, after I saw that, I was able to rethink that spread and go, oh, okay, now I need to carry on in my writing with the kind of intensity that was put into the pictures. It definitely was a collaborative back and forth process. And uh, with with me, I was able with uh, um, with the artist and with John to uh, take ideas and see how much further we could bring them. For instance, on uh, what's two A is the um, uh, the Hamilton and Burr's uh, slap down just before they become uh, duelists, in which it is done as a text message system. And <laughs> I think we have the art here for that. And for um, for that, we have. Uh, um, uh, a great idea that came from from John, which was to put their their little heads in the uh, on either side. Uh, <laughs> and, Hamilton but it's, emojis, but it's but it's still a scroll. Yeah, sure. they're emojis. <laughs> so there's Hamilton on the right. Um, in the next one, this is where I said to John, "Okay, I need a poster uh, for the Lincoln Douglas debates." So we boiled down what their arguments were on either side. But I need it to look like some WrestleMania, if you could do that. So we have that set up, because actually Abe Lincoln was a pro wrestler. I don't know if you know that, he's in the Wrestling yeah. Hall of Fame. True. Uh, in the next one, I've got Susan B. Anthony moving off to, uh, her family's moving to Rochester. And I just wanted to find a way to get the facts in there. Uh, for instance, it takes two days to go 30 miles. Uh, what's from Rochester, and I'm from Rochester, and I wanted to put that in the book somewhere. <laughs> so I thought I'd put it on an interstate sign because I'm on the throughway. <laughs> so there's a way to get the information across. We're just like, uh, give me something like that. Sure. Uh, and one more, which is specific to Comic Con, is that the Constitutional Convention or Congressional Con Continental Congress, rather, we called it Con Con. Sure. <laughs> and so. As a, you could see the patches in the corners because it was just thrown together in no time. But uh, in Washington and Adams, they're talking stuff. But um, here you have Con Con as, uh, you know, they, they're all together. They're getting their badges. They're signing in, you know, and they're and in some of them, they, they get very excited. The delegates are very excited to see celebrities. Thank one of the but one of the things that we were able to do with this series, especially, and I think this is the this kind of the, the way to kind of wrap up our our, our, to our readers, we want to say thank you to the readers because we now know and we understand that they're sophisticated enough to understand that no, there were not actual interstate signs in New York in 1890 or whatever it was. And they didn't actually call it con con with signs and, and there were no Hamilton emojis, but they know the difference. They understand kids today are sophisticated enough. They're used to this medium. This is something they're already, it's already in their lives. And so for us to be able to um, add some humor, add some fun bonus stuff to a factual presentation with the beautiful art, um, it, it really is a great, it's, it's, a, it's a complete package for any teacher looking to um, bring history to life. Uh, I think it was Mark who came up with the perfect tagline for this is that show me history is a time machine you can read. And, and I'm, I'm proud of the fact that we don't um, give the, it too simplified, but we do make it possible to simplify challenging things. Um, if we go to the last uh, screenshots for a second, four, uh, we have, we boiled down some big parts of history into things kids can really get their heads around. Do you know what's in the Declaration of Independence? Really? 
do you know what it says? I read your but book, so yes, I know. <laughs> we have it here, and we can, and if we show it to you, um, I have a visual of it. Um, all of it has been broken down to that. That's it. That's what it says. You know, he's lost his mind. He started a war. We've tried to settle. And we're done. Or in the next, uh, we have an image of Washington's farewell address, 38 pages of writing boiled down to these points with Hamilton's writing. Or as John was bringing up before, a piece of the theory of relativity. Here you go, traveling through space. When, there is gra when there's no object, it's a short trip. When there is an object, time warps along with the distance and time takes longer. The clock's on the right. John and I went back and forth a lot on this, <laughs> but, but we got it. Look, you can see what happens to time based on the presence of a mass in space. Ah. Yeah. So by doing that, we were able to give you something that wasn't available. I couldn't find it no matter how much I looked. And that's kind of why I'm so proud of these books. They're not just comics. They really are a way to compress bits of information so that a kid can grasp them, maybe even an adult. But one of the questions I had here was uh, how, to get, how to get kids excited. And as you're going through those screenshots, I find myself moving up to the screen to <laughs> read your Declaration of Independence and, and stuff. So uh, I could see it for myself. I think you just, you get the books out there. Because um, I, know, I know what the kids in my class, when they see that graphic novel, because they're used to Dog Man and, and Diary of a Wimpy Kid, and suddenly now they're opening up this graphic nonfiction. And it's an excellent opportunity to teach the kids the difference between a graphic novel and nonfiction in, in a way they can understand because they're still adults. I mean, I had to learn the not fake and fake, right? F is fiction, that's fake, and nonfiction is NF, not fake. And I just learned that last week. <laughs> but but um, in this whole process, as you were talking about paring down 38 pages to one, how long, what's, what length of time does it take to create, like, you can pick any book that you want, uh, uh, whether it's Albert Einstein or Ben Franklin. What's the length of time from when you get your topic until it's actually at press? From topic to press, I'd say something like a year, but yeah. um, it does move in and out based on other things. But, um, you know, you spend, it's like jumping in the water. So there's a part for a writer that's standing on the edge and staring at all of that stuff before you can really jump in and, and, and make it happen. The writing might take a month or two because it's evolving again while the book is made and you see the art, you, you rewrite it a lot. Uh, as the art is coming in, John is lettering it. Uh, to make sure that you can, um, that everything fits. So we letter it when it, the art isn't finished, but it's in a, in a rough enough stage that things can be moved around. So we get all the words in. Then while that's all being looked at by the editors to see that it's okay, the art is being finalized. It's being inked and it's, and John is, is making sure that the, the, the final balloons and all the, all the writing is in place. And we're going back and editing to make sure we didn't change anything. And suddenly, you know, Ben Franklin's a jet skier. Which very happened. cool. Very, very nice, Mark. We got to wrap it up. Okay. So that wraps up our questions. I want to thank all of you very much for joining us. It's been an educational and fun experience. For anyone interested, you can learn more about the Show Me History series at showmehistory.com. Thanks, all of you been a very informative very fun day guys all have a great day see you soon thanks bob thanks teachers thank you